Monica Song is a national co-lead of Dentons Canada Regulatory Practice Group and leads the communications law group at the firm. Recognized as a leading expert in communications law, Monica is a senior partner with a deep understanding in, of the Canadian legislative and public policy policy as it affects clients that are spearheading growth and innov innovation in the digital economy. Parlaying decades of experience as a leading lawyer in her field, Monica oversees intersectional mandates in relation to rapidly evolving technology, media, and the telecom sector. Outside of her work at the firm, Monica recently served for over a year and a half on the Government of Canada's Broadcasting and Telecommunications Legislative Review Panel, which issued its final report entitled Canada's Communications Future Time to Act in January 2020. She currently holds office of the Broadcasting Arbitrator of Canada. Having been appointed in, appointed in July 2020 by Chief Electoral Officer of Canada on the unanimous, unanimous recommendation of the registered political parties represented in the House of Commons. Thank you, Monica. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted uh, to join both the virtual audience and the physical audience in the IBI facilities in Toronto to this session in conversation with Ian Scott, the role of regulatory leadership in propelling smart cities. Um, Ian Scott is the chairperson and the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission of Canada. Um, Ian has over 30 years of policy and regulatory experience in broadcasting and telecommunications, both in the public and private uh, sectors. There is perhaps no one active today in Canada who has had as very and rich exposure to the different aspects of the communications industry in Canada. Over his 30 years, he has had stints at the Competition Bureau, uh, the CRTC, uh, Telesat Canada, Telus Colnet Enterprises, which is one of the first companies to offer competition in the Canadian long distance market. And he's also uh, served in a leadership capacity as an executive at the Canadian Cable Television Association. Ian has also served on various boards, including Women in Communications and Technology and Ski Quebec Alpin. Um, so please join me in welcoming Ian Scott. Ian, delighted Thank you. to have you with that us. That was a very long introduction. <laughs> I think I'm either, well, either I can't keep a job or I'm just old. Maybe, <laughs> may, maybe both, but we'll call it- I think it, neither. <laughs> we'll, call, we'll call it varied or experienced. <laughs> But I appreciate um, the welcome and I appreciate being here. This is a, a bit of a different um, forum for me. Um, and uh, no one, hopefully, I, virtually they can't throw bed buttons at me. So, <laughs> um, so I look forward to it. Welcome. So, um, Ian, um, smart cities. I, I would posit to you that we there are going to offer the audience a smart part of the smart cities <laughs> equation. Um, so uh, before before we begin, um, how about uh, giving us a few opening opening uh, thoughts? Well, one, I just I said I'm delighted to be here, and as you pointed out, I uh, I am the current chair of the CRTC. So what I'm not doing today, as is uh, would be obvious to all the lawyers in the room, mm -hmm. is talking about any of the open proceedings we have in front of us. There are not many that have direct bearing, but there are a few things around building access and barriers to deployment mm -hmm. uh, of broadband and wireless technologies that are open proceedings. So I will skirt around those as appropriate uh, in our discussion. Uh, and I really am um, speaking for myself today. Uh, most of these issues do not um, impinge directly on the CRTC's jurisdiction. Uh, so I'm quite happy and ready to chat. Excellent. Well, we, we're, we're, the audience, I'm sure, is going to uh, take a lot from all your years of experience um, in the communications uh, sector. So I guess I'm going to begin by, by saying, you know, there, there are a few uh, different definitions when different stakeholders think about what a smart, smart city means, whether you're looking at it from the perspective of government, uh, NGOs, uh, or the private sector. But I think it's fair to say that overall, when we think about uh, smart cities, we're generally referring to the integration uh, of the power of computing uh, and the application of technology information management tools to urban uh, centers. Uh, the deployment of ubiquitous technologies is at the forefront of the modern uh, smart city. 
So smart cities will bring together infrastructure and technology to improve the quality of life of citizens and enhance their interactions with the urban environment. It's, a smart city is made up of different components, uh, ranging from smart water, smart metering, smart shopping, smart roads, et cetera. Um, and these elements are made possible through their connection to uh, telecommunications networks and systems. And it's perhaps uh, here that the starting point of our discussion uh, lies. So to enable the technological functions of a smart city, information must be provided in real time or in anticipation of local needs. Um, infrastructure such as 5G telecommunications and satellite broadband can support and enable the always on connectivity requirements upon which uh, so many of the applications of smart cities uh, will depend. So I note um, that in the Canadian context, uh, in 2018, the federal Quebec and Ontario governments pledged a commitment to expanding 5G uh, mobile network access and to cooperating in, in doing so. Uh, in 2021, interestingly, the government of Ontario moved aggressively to pass the Building Broadband Faster Act to give the Minister of Infrastructure order making powers over electricity transmitters and distributors uh, to entice them to provide timely access to their infrastructure thereby arguably filling a, a, a legal vacuum, a legislative vacuum identified by the Federal Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada and the Barry Public Utilities uh, decision. In April, 2022, so just uh, in the last few months, the Ontario Broadband Building Fasters Act was amended to enable new requirements and standards whereby municipalities must respond to requests for right-of-way access uh, to proponents of so-called designated broadband projects, as of yet no other provinces have, have followed suit. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pause there and, and ask you, how well prepared do you think we are in Canada um, and in the provinces to scaling up to seamless online access across entire cities, metropolitan areas, or, or regions? I hope that's the hardest question you're going to give me today. <laughs> Probably. There are a lot of elements in there um, and um, a lot of important developments and some of them quite germane to regulators' work or areas where regulators have not been able to work in a meaningful cross-jurisdictional way. But let's start with the fundamentals. Um, mm -hmm. Whether you want uh, smart cities or smart agriculture in rural areas, you need, as you said, the connectivity. Mm -hmm. um, and so we and other parts of government do play a very important role there. But I mean, the first part are reliable, high-speed connections uh, with low latency. Um, and that is, you know, sort of the water in the swimming pool, not much point swimming around uh, without the water in it. Um, and, and Canada's done pretty well in that regard. Um, so let's just talk about broadband for a moment and, um, and the way it's been evolving. So just a quick sort of report card on where we are in Canada. Um, the CRTC had set an aspirational target um, about seven years ago of 50 megabit down, um, downstream and 10 up. Uh, that's largely been adopted by provincial federal governments. It's now government policy. Um, that number is going to change, I think, over time, be become bigger. I'll, I'll come back to that, or higher speeds. Um, but with respect to the 5010 target, we're now, I think these numbers are about to come out. If they're not already out, I think we're at 91.7% mm -hmm. uh, of Canadians uh, have access. Uh, it's not an entire success story because um, when you dive into that um, rural areas, uh, it's improving. It used to be around 40%. It's over 50 now. Mm -hmm. uh, and in indigenous communities used to be in the low 20s and they're in the high 20s. Uh, and that we often talk about as a digital divide. Um, and that's been the focus recently, certainly during my mandate at the CRTC, uh, and I think of current government, um, in terms of addressing that digital divide um, that is getting service to the uncertain areas, right. high, you know, reliable service. Um, cities have that service, generally speaking, 
Um, but it's not perfect. And there, you know, I think it's a bit of a life cycle. The pendulum will go back and forth. We're actually quite making really good progress, I think, as a country towards getting essentially 100% coverage. And then once those unserved communities um, are done, so to speak, I think there'll be a return focus on improved connectivity in, in, in the urban centers. Mm -hmm. It's there, but capacity can be limited. It's not perfect, it never is. Beyond that, for um, smart cities to work, you know, you need coordinated government policy spectrum needs to be released sort of early and often. Mm -hmm. I think the industry would say in the right spectrum, um, you need connected devices. That includes, you know, that Canada's seldom, if ever, going to be introducing new devices mm -hmm. or new standards. We need to follow. We're not big enough to have a commercialized products or products commercialized just for Canada. Mm -hmm. um, so they need to be done. Um, and you also, you know, need to measure success and, and how it goes along. But back to the digital divide for a second. There's another aspect to it. Um, I recently moderated an international regulatory session, and I was quite fascinated because typical of North America, I looked at the divide right. in the way that I just described it. We had a representative from Sweden there who basically said, well, we've got the country covered, yeah. uh, including the most northern areas. We essentially have 100% coverage, but we have 90% um, penetration, or we have 10% of the country not adopting. And that, he said, is a big problem. Um, they are essentially cashless. They don't, they're, they're a very digital society. Um, and so people not connecting mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reasons is a big problem. There was someone from a Caribbean nation, Trinidad and Tobago, in that case, who said, oh, I have the same problem. Mm -hmm. Adoption is also a problem. They're not as far advanced in terms of coverage, um, but there was about only... I think it was about 80% coverage and around 40% adoption with them going in particular, the agricultural community farmers were not interested, right. um, didn't have digital literacy, weren't interested. So unless the technology fits, you know, the purpose, um, I assume if there were agricultural technologies that improve their output or mm -hmm. reduce their cost of production and so on, they might be more interested. Um, but And so that's an example. Adoption, we haven't looked at in the same way, but it's an important part of the digital divide. So building it doesn't necessarily mean that the they people will come. will come. No, I think that's right. And we can contemplate, I think there's a number of reasons why uh, affordability is one. But back to the Swedish example, they use vouchers for low-income uh, families. So mm -hmm. that apparently is not the reason. Mm -hmm. So it can be digital literacy, it could be language constraints, um, new new arrivals mm -hmm. that um, aren't as um, digitally savvy, uh, or English, or in their case, Swedish, not their first language. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a number of factors. Um, uh, elderly, not, I can operate a computer, but uh, my 96-year-old mother doesn't. Right. Uh, so, I mean, there's a number of categories, but it's not something that's gotten as much attention as availability of the service, but I think adoption is going to be a, a very important issue. Yeah, so so be, take, taking it outside of, there's a lesson to be learned, arguably, from that broadband deployment um, anecdote that, that you're counting from your international uh, experience and um, and um, the lesson should probably be transposed to anybody who's thinking about deploying a smart cities project in that not not necessarily everyone is going to be um, uh, ready to adopt. Ready or able or financially yeah. able. That's right. And yeah. if you if it's going to be effective, I think it has to be largely inclusive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Um, so you're mentioning barriers. So what other what other barriers do you see to um, Canada being at the forefront of smart cities uh, development? Aside from the CRTC, you mean? Oh, we'll yeah. come back to that. Nice <laughs> it must be our fault. It's always a I'm sure none of it fault. is. Um, you know, the big, I'd say the biggest barrier, and, and I think it was actually in the context of 
the expert panel that was looking um, forward looking. Um, I, uh, I appeared before the Senate of Canada. And I remember at the time saying, you know, jurisdictional or the jurisdictional quagmire mm -hmm. um, is one of the key issues. And there, there are a number of ways you outline some of um, the legislative initiatives that have um, that have been pursued um, in one or more jurisdictions, um, cooperation agreements. Um, and I should note on the broadband side that one of the reasons we've been successful in beginning to bridge a digital divide has been very effective cooperation between provincial, territorial, and federal government. Right. On the uh, broadband funding. On the broadband funding side. Yeah. And that's a good model for the future. And we need obviously to add municipalities in that when we talk about mm -hmm. um, smart cities and and getting all of the, we'll call it, access to support structures and rights of way right. worked out. Right. Um, but I, I think, and we do have a proceeding open, so I'm, I'm being careful as to um, what, I, uh, what I say about this, but um, it's clear that we need close cooperation and coordination um, or definitive legislative and legal rulings and right. court rulings um, to sort of clear things up. Um, absent that, it just cooperation may be the key. Right. And so here, Ian, you're, you're referring to in, in specific to the challenges of accessing physical infrastructure uh, whether it be uh, roadways, rights of ways, uh, poles, um, bus shelters, shelters buildings, buildings, right, rooftops, to, to, to house to house the the wireless network deployments of the future, correct? Yes, yeah. and all of the necessary approvals that one must get from whether it's the owner of the poles, the owner of the bus shelter, the owner of the rights of way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, what what solutions are being proposed, or 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 is there? Well, I think look, it wasn't very many years ago when I think there were real disconnects, no pun intended. I mean, between mm -hmm. federal and provincial jurisdictions. But as I said, there's been a lot more cooperation, mm -hmm. and I think. Provinces, Ontario's um, legislative approach is is very direct, very very clear. Yeah. Um, uh, as you mentioned, I don't think any other province has uh, taken that approach. Mm -hmm. But clearly, it's meant to focus on that very issue: how do you get rid of the roadblocks right. um, to allow for the effective uh, introduction um, or not introduction, uh, construction, deployment of the facilities. One example that I found interesting is what was done in the U.S., and it's not a complete solution, but the SCC, the CRTC equivalent, has the ability um, in their legislation to convene um, groups. Right. And they did so with municipal, state governments, federal players, mm -hmm. um, and carriers um, to try and improve the efficiency of deployment of 5G and other technologies, particularly in municipalities. Right. Uh, and so some of the things they discussed were model agreements for tariffs. Um, they did ultimately propose certain rates. Um, you know, but simply getting all of those parties together in one space um, could be quite important. I can imagine two, well, look at it this way. Just think of a situation in Canada. Let's pose a sort of problem on one side and then talk yes, about maybe solution. a potential solution. Yeah. So yeah. here's a, a, an obvious problem. Um, a number of um, provinces have um, public sector hydro utilities, mm -hmm. and they have traditionally cooperated or have various forms of agreements with uh, what we often call incumbent telephone companies. Um, so they would have agreements and whoever gets to a street first or a rural area will put in poles and they both are, avail themselves of. Yeah. And how they work it out is different in different provinces and so on. Yeah. And so you have these traditional arrangements and now you have competition and new competitors wanting to come in attached to those, um, to those poles. Um, a province in that case has a legitimate interest in how well its public interest from a hydro utility 
um, is served, mm -hmm. uh, and the I, the phone company or the service provider has equally a private interest and wants to um, get its economic fair economic return, mm -hmm. um, and they and 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 the cities, if they're involved, municipalities, um, they want high quality service and they want to have a smart city. Um, but they also have an economic incentive yeah. um, to leverage their um, structures and so on. Yeah. So you see the obvious conflict, and the question is, how can you resolve it? So one way, as we talked about, will be through the courts and through legislation. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's going to happen quickly. Right. Well, actually, I can say it won't happen quickly. Yeah. Um, and it'll be a very difficult process. Another way, and I really throw this out there because I'm not sure it has been done, um, although there, there are some, some examples of some similar activities, might be to gather all of those affected parties to try and negotiate an arrangement. So rather than having, for example, to say um, the federal government will have jurisdiction, exclusive jurisdiction or shared jurisdiction over over hydro poles yeah. in, in, for example, in a province, what might be done is they reach an agreement that says, okay, no, we'll keep our jurisdiction, mm -hmm. our provincial jurisdiction, but we'll agree to basic terms and conditions. Maybe one of the regulators sets terms and conditions for access, and all of the parties agree to accept that as a baseline or a price cap uh, of sorts, yeah. or it could be on terms and conditions of access and so on. And from a private sector perspective, they have an interest in helping do it in an efficient manner. Right. So it's kind of looking for a win-win-win between various levels of government. Um, and I could imagine such a thing being convened and being, you know, a, a quicker way to reach agreement. Yeah, food for thought. I mean, it's interesting that you you your your you know starting point on on this discussion um, item. Ian was uh, the United States, where actually the states have far more extensive powers for interstate telecommunications than the CRTC does. Mm -hmm. um, in um, in uh, sorry, the provinces, in, the provinces do do. in in Canada, yes. um, and the fact that that model of cooperation was was uh, used in the U.S. is is interesting for infrastructure access. And and the second point, if 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 you'll allow me, because it's not really a question, although. Although feel free to respond is is that the, the CRTC has always been not only the regulator of of um, you know good quality telecommunication services but also competition in this industry and that mandate is a very important part of the CRTC's remit to make sure that that um, rates are just and reasonable not only between um, telecommunications common carriers and consumers or customers, but also between telecommunications common carriers and their wholesale customers. Absolutely. Um, I'm not sure that that same um, mantra or 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 um, approach is necessarily uh, assumed um, in, say, provincial um, occupation. Of no, and you raise a good point. And I just, you know, when I said providers, I don't mean only. Um, the incumbent facilities-based providers, uh, it has to be the others involved in, in the marketplace serving customers. Right. Um, and that can be dealt with, you know, in a, in a number of ways. But yes, absolutely, that's another seat at the table. Yeah. But again, it's, it's to try and find a win-win-win. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think I've just been flashed the three minute uh, mark, three minute so mark. it's going to be the rapid fire round All of right. our little chat, uh, Ian. So, how about um, autonomous vehicles? Any thoughts on on that um, and smart cities? You know, it's a question of um, the tech, the evolution, the journey is going to be the problem. When we when you get there and everyone's on the same platform and you sort of have perfect control, but we're not there, and then we're a long way from that. And 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 it's, um, you know, my concern at the moment would be some of the ethical issues involved mm -hmm. um, in where you have some autonomous vehicles, others not autonomous. How do you, um, what, what kind of parameters are set uh, in, in various cases? You know, use the lifeboat analogy. Right. Um, yeah, could, could be applied uh, 
it, it's just, I think there are some complex ethical issues and programming issues that are going to be difficult decisions, but decisions that need to be made, you know, by society as a whole, right. uh, not by, you know, some programmer in a dark room. Right, right. So the technology might be there, but, but to society. Not all of the ethical rules. More conversations about, about those. And done in a transparent way so that yeah. citizens understand. Right. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I mean, you, we could we could have an expansive discussion on, on that point, really, to talk about um, the, some of the privacy implications of, of smart cities deployment. Um, we've seen in Canada um, the Sidewalk Labs initiative and that experience, um, um, but I'm not sure that time allows us this. The um, title of our panel was, you know, regulatory uh, leadership, the role of regulatory leadership in smart city deployment. So perhaps I'll hand it back over to you for a so closing, yeah, so closing thoughts on, on the role of well, regulation. I guess my intent while I've been at the CRTC and I guess my message for future leadership would be don't mess it up. Um, <laughs> regulators play an interesting role. You're always balancing, you know, I talked about finding a win-win-win and regulators are always balancing the various private and public, you know, to, to find the public interest means balancing the various other, other interests. I think regulation has to facilitate the deployment um, and, 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 you know, education around technology. But equally important, it has to get out of the way and not be burdensome um, to deploying it. So I think that's the message. You know, regulators need to choose their battles, um, help efficient deployment of technology, right. and not hinder it with unnecessary rules or burden. Yeah, and some of the uh, perhaps what's needed is the an influx of creativity in, in thinking as well as as you pointed which out which will come with the technology yeah um come new solutions to old problems great well um that 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 i think brings us to the conclusion of our little fireside chat ian thank you so much for joining well, us today thanks. and this afternoon um thank you to the audience uh, both virtually and uh, in person in toronto so thank, thank you, thank you for and inviting I'm, me Thank you. I'm handing it back over to Katrina.